fans, welcome to the Toy Lions Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Romero. Today's podcast is brought to you by the South Lake Brewing Company. Try their new IPA, the Shell Shaka. Cowabunga! Enjoy a smooth West Coast IPA with your favorite pizza, the IPA Shell Shaka. Only available at the South Lake Brewing Company. So, Toy fans, today I have a special guest with us. She is the creator of I Am Elemental, Miss Julie Kerwin. How are you doing, Julie? I'm great. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me, Tom. Oh, thanks for being here. So uh, how are you coping with uh, this COVID pandemic? Um, you know, we're doing okay. My family is safe and we're healthy and together in New York City, which is um, no small, you know, doing. But, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, we're six months in now. So things are, we're, we're coming back to life there, you know, the streets were empty and we were on serious lockdown during the height of the epidemic. We were the epicenter of it, but now I actually was walking in Central Park today and there were musicians singing again. And they're actually, do you know what I saw today, Tom, that I haven't seen in six months I saw all of these little sports, after school sports classes going on, all these preschoolers playing soccer and little athletic things. And that actually, it just occurred to me that that is something I haven't seen in six months. So, you know, while my son just started high school today from our dining room table, Wow, good luck. We're not in a position where it's all over by any stretch of the imagination. And I think that I think that he's going to be in remote schooling for quite a while, but signs of life. And that's very exciting. That is. Good luck with you and your first day of uh, high school. It was an, it was an exciting day. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, Julie, where'd you grow up? Take me back for, for a while. Where, where's your origins coming from? I'm from Philadelphia originally. Um, I was born in Mount Airy, a small area of Philadelphia. And then I moved to the suburbs for school and I spent my entire time in the Philadelphia suburbs until I went off to college and then to New York. I had a very nice childhood. You know, I suffered some early loss because my mother died of breast cancer when I was eight years old. And, you know, obviously this is not a happy story, but I had a happy life. So, you know, the good news is, is that you can survive tragedy and you can emerge from it and have a nice life anyway. So that's kind of my background. Now, what kind of toys did you play with as a child? Well, before she died, my mother was very invested in a certain kind of play pattern. I We had a lot of blocks. We had blocks, buckets and buckets of blocks, all shapes and sizes in milk crates um, lined up in our little playroom area. And we had Playmobil action figures. Those were the ones that she, I guess, embraced and felt were represented the play pattern she wanted. I laugh because there were no Barbies in our house. It was clearly a very specific choice of hers. She was coming of age herself during the, you know, Ms. Magazine, uh, I Am Woman, Hear Me Roar generation. And so she was making very specific decisions about what she wanted her children to play with. And so there were uh, stuffed animals, but no Barbies. And I, of course, played with Barbies down the street at my neighbor's house because that's what you had to do. But, you know, I always say that my, one of my clearest memories is of her sitting down with me and giving me a book that was free to be on me and a record that came with it. And this was became kind of a cult classic. Marlo Thomas had been very unhappy with the offerings for her niece. And so she kind of decided she was going to come up with this storytelling that was uh, a little bit more equal in its gender, you know, kind of the way it explained gender and how you could be anything. And so these were the messages I was getting from my mother. So obviously a lot of that was seeded when I went to kind of develop I Am Elemental. Your mother kind of 
guided you into creativity with the blocks and her all her teachings. A hundred percent. I, you know, it's, I do think that despite my early loss, she planted a lot of seeds, Tom, a lot. You know, one of our uh, mantras that we've adopted from this documentary series called Seven Up, which was done by the BBC over decades, yes. starts with a quote and it says, give me a child of seven and I'll give you the man. And so, you know, it's this idea that our core is formed very early in life. And so obviously my mother did a lot of core building before her death. You know, I also subscribe to the notion that we're a work in progress until the day we die. So, you know, as, as I am, but, but she did a lot of seed planting and I do think that it's, you know, not uninteresting to realize how much of those seed planting moments were then used later in the creation of I'm Elemental. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Let's go to the origins of I'm Elemental. So you went to one of your children's school functions, and there was a doctor, a brain surgeon. Correct um, me if I'm wrong. I, I don't know that she was a brain surgeon, but she was a neuroscientist. She came to the school, which was a single sex school for boys, and her lecture was about brain development and boys. And so I went to hear her. her name's Joanne Deke. She's really interesting, much funnier than I am, but very interesting person, very smart, but she, you know, she was had a nice kind of relatable aspect to her. So you, you know, despite the fact that she was talking about all these higher level ideas, it was, you know, easily digestible. And she was talking about boys, but one of the things that she said at that lecture was girls and boys are as different from the neck up as they are from the neck down. And, you know, by the way, she was very adamant at the start of her lecture that she told us very clearly that none of what she was telling us was opinion. It was all based on scientific fact. So I took this nugget, this idea of girls and boys having different brains home with me and that was the catalyst for the creation of I Am Elemental because it made me think about what I would have to do to an action figure to make it appeal to what she was calling a girl brain as opposed, opposed to a boy brain. And that was the kind of spark that created the company. Now, do you, how much validity do you have in, in her theory? I mean, do you really believe there's a boy brain versus a girl brain? Well, you know, I talk about the fact that the irony is, is that while I was using the concept of a girl brain and a boy brain in the development of the company, over the last six years, I've really come to a, a different opinion in my own world based on my own non-scientific, but very long-term study uh, with my customers. I have come really to believe that the brain has no gender and that while we can certainly talk in generalizations about girls and boys, and you and I, Tom, could probably talk for the next two hours on nature versus nurture. You know, another thing I remember from my Psych 101 class freshman year of college was I had a psychology professor who said it's 100 percent nature and 100 percent nurture, you know, which is to say, who really knows? Right. We can arise. But my research, my unintended research project over the last six years has really led me to feel very strongly that um, it's wrong to speak in generalizations when you're talking about this type of thing because it's very limiting. And so one of the things that we do in I'm Elemental is that wherever we go, when whether it's Comic-Con or Toy Fair or a school event, I bring with me these life-size shields that represent the powers in the I Am Elemental universe. And right now we have two of the seven already in production, and those two are courage and wisdom. And so there's seven building blocks in each one. And so I have 14, well, actually, that's not true. I have 16 shields because I include wisdom and courage, and then I have the building blocks. And wherever we go, I ask everyone who comes to see me to pick their power. And I'm very clear, I say, 
You have all of these powers inside of you. I just want you to tell me which power speaks to you the most right now. Uh, which one do you think represents you? And one of the things that has amazed me is that in six years, not one person has ever randomly grabbed a shield for their photo op. Because that's what we do. We take their picture. Not one person. Every single person, girl, boy, man, woman, no matter their age, their sex, their gender, they go through these powers, these shields, and they look for the one that they think speaks to them. I call it a window into their soul. Actually, I joke. I say, you know, you're telling me who you are by doing this. We have a lot of fun with it. But the truth is, is that what I've come to understand is that when we stop talking in generalizations and stop thinking about, let's say, marketing a product for a gender or an idea for a gender, and we just ask people to think about who, their own individual powers, there is zero a breakdown on gender lines. In fact, if anything, sometimes some of the powers that, that maybe a marketing company or a television studio thinks of represents a certain gender is, is we see the opposite almost. So when you see toys advertised for girls and boys, a lot of times the boy commercials talk about energy, bravery, lots of, you know, strong action uh, ones and girls get, you know, honesty and creativity. And these are important powers for everyone. But what we find in our in our research is that often, in fact, more men pick honesty than women and more women pick energy than men. So, you know, what we're seeing is a demystification, so to speak, of that research. Now, who am I to tell Joanne Deke, a trained doctor, that the brain has no gender? I think that probably if she were here, she would say, Julie, Tom, we're talking, you know, there's hormones involved, estrogen, testosterone, all sorts of things that maybe she would bring up. But as far as I'm concerned, after doing my own unscientific six years of research, you really cannot tell a person's gender by their brain and the way in which it acts. Oh, of course not. All the traits that you mentioned are all universal. Absolutely. And that I think is the irony of I am Elemental's existence is that what I was doing is I was asking a question and I was saying, you know, where are the action figures for girls? And I was trying to think about what I had to do to make an action figure that appealed to a girl. But the reality is, is that the concept that we came up with is, as you say, universal. And, you know, by the way, it's not just universal girl boy. It is globally universal. These are human humanity. It's, you know, this is the, you know, it translates all over the globe. I actually sell a lot of action figures in Australia and we have a nice European market. And, and when we launched on Kickstarter, we had buyers in all 50 states and six continents. So, you know, it was a very interesting thing to understand as someone who'd never built a product or a concept or a business out before that often you're filling one hole, but your, your audience ends up being much broader. Why, um, why Kickstarter? How, how was that experience? Uh, I love my Kickstarter experience. And one of the things I always laugh about and, and, and say to people is if you, if Tom, if you were sitting here with me and I were to show you my notebook from, you know, ground zero, my very first notebook, uh, when, when all the ideas were coming out, like, you know, it was like a fire hose out of us tiny little spigot. It was crazy those first few weeks. Once I had the idea, I was like a madman. And in that first- Or a woman. We are, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Touché. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw you no, off. <laughs> it's you're absolutely right. That's funny. Anyway, I was in my first week, Kickstarter was written down. And I said, I called it testing the hypothesis. And so from the very beginning, we were, we knew that we were going to use Kickstarter as a way to prove that there was a market 
for female action figures designed specifically for girls as opposed to adult male collector, collectors, meaning non-sexualized. Non you know, we felt that the female action figures on the market, obviously, I'm not the first person to make a female action figure. There are decades and decades of female action figures. But the reality and the truth is, is that most of those action figures were being designed for the adult male collector. And so over, you know, they, they tended to be hypersexualized in a way that today we recognize as being maybe not necessarily appropriate to put in the hands of a child as a toy because, you know, I mean, I had this Pandora's box, we called it, of all the bad action figures, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes the boobs were bigger than the heads. Actually, a lot of boobs were bigger than the heads. Um, you know, their waists were so tiny and wasp-like that you knew that if you had the magic power to make this action figure into a human being, she would fall over because she had no rib cage. I had a, an unusual obsession with the bum cracks. There, I mean, you know, it's like once you see it, you can't unsee it. Even if it's something that you didn't notice for a long time, you know, we opened our Kickstarter with the question, where are the action figures for girls? And we showed a police lineup of all of the hypersexualized action figures. Oh, they also have their their legs are incredibly long. So, you know, like long legs that no one could ever physically have. As someone who has short legs herself, I would love to have legs that long, but that's another story. Anyway, what we were doing was reinventing the action figure from a physical and from a concept position. So, but that is where we were going with it. And, and we thought that we were building something out for kids, but it ended up because we tried to be really forward thinking in our design and our engineering of it, uh, appealing to a lot of different people. So what were your designing influences? I'm, I'm looking at Courage right now on my desk and Am I detecting a hint of a, like a manga flair or some yes. manga influence? Definitely. So just like we had our Pandora's box of action figures that were inappropriate, we also had inspiration action figures because I, I had never designed an action figure before. Um, you know, by the way, one of the things that I failed to mention is that while my mother did not purchase lots of action figures in my life, aside from the Playmobil action figures, my children have lots and lots of action figures. And so I had buckets and buckets of action figures in my house. So it's not as if I'd never seen a good action figure before, but we trended toward Star Wars. We had a lot of, um, we had all the Harry Potter action figures, Spy Kids. We were collecting things that were kind of sets, um, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings. So we had these series of action figures. Obviously we had some superhero action figures as well, but Ours were slightly different in, in every Star Wars action figure imaginable. Um, and the Star Wars action figures did come into play later. But in terms of looking at female action figures, the ones that I ended up loving were the Figma action figures in Japan. And one of the things that attracted to them to me initially were the colors. They had these very high gloss, bright colors that I found really appealing. You know, everyone jokes that I sleep with my Pantone book next to me. A Pantone book is a book of colors, the color wheel. I have a slight obsession with color. I really like finding unusual and odd combinations. So the Figma figures, just from a color perspective, wowed me beyond anything that I'd had in those buckets of action figures that my kids had. But the second thing about them was the articulation. Um, they had a really beautiful high level of articulation. And while our small three and three quarter inch figures uh, have, you know, I, there's some debate over the number of points of articulation. It depends on who you're talking to, but nine to 11 uh, points of articulation, depending on who, uh, how you count. Once we built that courage figure that you have in your hands, it was post Kickstarter. And we'd had this tremendous response from the collector community that was uh, so gratifying and remarkable and humbling that we were really determined to make sure that our next figure wowed the collector community. And so the courage figure that you have in your hand has more than 30 points of articulation. And it was all about appealing to the collectors 
And so we're really proud of that. And we did use the Japanese uh, manga figures as our inspiration. I love this quote you gave. If you give a girl a different toy, she will tell a different story. That's an incredible, that's a powerful quote. Thank you. Yes, it really, I think that it, it, it was an important quote because it really helped to center our messaging. Because one of the things that we always said is, is that, you know, even though my mother was opposed to Barbie, philosophically, I am not opposed to, to, to the idea of Barbie. I always say that, you know, we are not anti-doll or anti-princess in any way, shape, or form. We just recognize, as you say, our tagline is that if you put an action figure in the hand of a child, the play pattern is different. It becomes a much more active uh, type of play, a much more save the world type of play. Um, a doll has, has hair that you brush. Uh, clothes that you change. It's a very different way of playing as a child. But when you put that courage action figure that you have in your hand, you know, even though those multiple points of articulation may have been designed for a collector, it is a really satisfying play pattern for a child. And it allows for a very different way of thinking. The other thing, if you'll, if you don't mind my jumping in on that too, is that you know, as the mom of two boys, it was really important to me that the action figure that we designed appeal to everyone because we argue that it's just as important to put a strong, powerful female action figure in the hands of a boy as it is a girl. You know, if we want to achieve gender equality in our lifetime, we have to educate both aisles, right? Both sides of the divide. And so what's been really gratifying is that while we are successfully changing play patterns in girl play, we're also seeing a shift in the way that boys play once we integrate the figure. And my favorite story about that is about a mom who came up to me after her boys fell in love with our action figures and they started putting them into their normal play pattern with their other action figures. And she was walking by one day past the room and she heard her son say, here she comes, here she comes to save the day. She's going to save you. And she approached me the next day and she said that she realized that she'd never heard him say those words before because there'd never been a female in the, in the, in the bucket. And so it was only males being the heroes and males doing the saving. And so, you know, we're not trying to hit people over the head with it, but we do argue that if you change the way they play, you can change the way children think about themselves and the world around them in a very organic and natural way that has a wonderful long-term benefit, but isn't, um, you know, luxury and um, uh, preaching. Yeah. So Julie, one of the cool aspects of your packaging was the periodic table of powers. Was that something that you had in the back of your head or did it happen, you know, naturally or? Yeah. So basically what happened is that both of my boys were in science programs at the American Museum of Natural History from the time they were very young. And so science played a really big role in our lives. And um, the night that I saw Joanne Deke speak about brain development, I came home and my husband and I were talking about it as we were falling asleep about um, this idea that I would have to reimagine a female action figure for a girl brain. And I must have slept on it overnight because I woke up the next morning and I said, I have the answer. It's not superheroes, it's superpowers. And I took a blank periodic table of elements that morning and I wrote in creativity and courage and bravery and wisdom. And my husband came home from work that night and I made him buy like 30 domain names. We were just going on and on and on and on trying to find whatever we could. Um, and that is where it came from. I literally woke up with the idea. But again, just like my mother was seeding things from my childhood, I really do think of the I am elemental as emerging from a stew of ideas and all of this kind of came together at just the right moment and um, emerged 
so to speak. But the periodic table of elements has been a really useful tool for developing the series because as I mentioned before, we have courage and we have wisdom, but we have seven series outlined. So essentially the goal is to, you know, to, to fill the periodic table of elements. And I think that it has worked really well for us in terms of helping us to explain our mission, because we really are arguing that these powers are um, things that are within all of us just like the elements. And so it works, it works exceptionally well. And, and I'm glad that we've done it that way. Now, what's in store for I Am uh, Elemental? Do you have any media coming up, a comic book, anything animated? Yeah. So one of the things, the only thing, Tom, that I have to confess to is that while the collector community embraced us from day one, and the reason that our Kickstarter was fully funded in 48 hours was because of our Kickstarter uh, collector community, because they were on Kickstarter, they understood Kickstarter, and so they embraced what we were doing, but they did have one complaint. And their complaint was that there was no backstory. And some of them may have called us lazy, but we were not being lazy. We were very deliberately avoiding story and content because we didn't want to spoon feed it to children. Our argument was that we wanted to give them the building blocks of story and have them create the stories themselves. Uh, it was a very deliberate plan. It was Again, in my very first week, this was not something that we came to lightly, but you have to listen to your customers and our customers wanted content. They've been asking for content from, from the beginning and, um, and it took a while. I, I will confess that we had phone calls from uh, Nickelodeon, from Disney, a lot of people early on wanting to turn our show into an animated series. And we didn't take a single meeting for a very long time because uh, as I've just described, we have seven series. It's a very interesting concept. It's more Mount Olympus than Justice League, quite frankly. And so, um, you know, these people were like, hey, let's make, you know, I guess what I imagine to be the equivalent of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with the Courage series, because that was our that was our Kickstarter uh, series. And that wasn't, you know, I, my reaction was, well, we can't make a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with the Courage series because we have wisdom coming up and then series three is justice and so on and so forth. And so um, a very dear friend of mine who happens to be in children's television basically told me, you can't take a meeting with any of these people until you know what you want. And the other issue that I personally had, and, and people may find this strange, but I was very wary of giving these powers personalities because um, since we want kids to identify with all of them, I got very scared of the idea of, you know, making, I don't know, honesty, the sweet one and energy, the spunky one and fear, the sarcastic one. And then people would choose the one that they wanted to be based on the character rather than the power. So it took me a very long time to figure out my origin story and figure out where we were going to go with this. But we do have an origin story now that um, I'm rather happy and pleased and excited about. I hope that I hope that the people asking for content feel the same way when they hear it. And um, we do have a, you know, a, a world built out. I was supposed to go to Los Angeles in March to do some pitching. Um, and that unfortunately was not possible because of the pandemic. So we're kind of on hold right now. But yes, we do have plans and hopes and dreams that we will be able to turn this into an animated series. You know, graphic novels would be wonderful and all sorts of things uh, moving forward. And that is the next step. And that's where we are going. Let's get into I Am Elemental like before your animated premise. Now, you mentioned fear. Yes. She's a very interesting character. 
because you look at the line and you're thinking, well, who's the villain? Where is, you know, who are they actually fighting? Fear is actually a good character, one, one of the heroes. Yes. Yeah, so that was another thing um, early on is that, um, and that was another, that, that went along with our lazy comments about our content, is that uh, people were assuming that, that fear was the villain and fear was absolutely 100% not the villain because we argue that fear is a biological trait that, that saves us, it protects us, it warns us of danger, and it is a building block of courage. And we very strongly believe that you cannot be a courageous person without fear. Uh, fear is actually one of our favorite powers. Um, and so she is most definitely not a villain. We just uh, explain it by saying that there are certain powers in the I am elemental universe that require a little bit more uh, care and feed feeding, so to speak, in terms of managing them, because obviously there is such a thing as too much fear. But but if an absence of fear would be a very bad thing. And um, oblivion is our is our difficult power in the wisdom series. You know, in that case, we argue that it's really important to be able to forgive and forget and blow away your worries and move on in life. But, you know, of course, if you forget the past, you're doomed to repeat it, as they say. So you really do have to navigate and manage the, those powers. Um, and to your point about the villain, that was another aspect of the I am elemental universe that was very uh, important to us. So I'll confess, when we were doing our Kickstarter video and I was doing the storyboards for it, I thought it would be hysterical to do this reverse trope concept. I imagined um, that instead of Luke swinging Leia across a ravine, that I would take our Luke action figure and I would put my action figure in the Luke place and have Luke under my action figure's arm and have my action figure swinging across the ravine, saving Luke and so on and so forth. I thought this was hysterical and quite frankly, brilliant. And my husband sat me down one night after the boys were asleep and he said to me, you know, I love you and I'm all for this girl power, you know, totally and completely. But I just want to remind you that you are raising two boys and you don't have to emasculate boys to lift up women. And I always say that that was the single best piece of advice I have gotten, Tom, in all the years of I am elemental mentoring and advice. And let me tell you, I have had some amazing mentors still have them, uh, wonderful advisors, people in the industry, all sorts of amazing people. And my husband's obviously not a toy maker. He's not, a, he doesn't make act television shows or action figures, but that one piece of advice changed everything because that's what opened us up to a larger audience because we didn't emasculate anyone or make anyone feel bad about this idea of power. But it also led to a bit of a conundrum in the world of villains, right? Because I didn't want a male villain, like it, girls versus boys. That was not where we were headed. But I also was very opposed to what I call girl on girl crime. You know, I did, there was a, right when we were developing this concept, there was this unbelievable um, explosion of girl violence in schools. You know, it used to be something like two incidents in every 10 in a, in a, in a school would be girl related, girl physical violence from a girl. And the numbers were creeping, creeping up. And I think it was almost 50% by when we were developing this. I haven't looked lately at the numbers, but it was troubling to me. You know, we were living in the era, it was the height of the reality TV era, Real Housewives and all of these shows, which were really predicated on the idea of women treating other women poorly. And so we didn't want to do that either with the villains. And, and that it was another reason why our content piece took so long to come together, because the villain has to be compelling. Right. There is no point in telling a story about people acting heroically 
if there's not a compelling villain to fight. And so that took some time, but, um, but I kind of like our villain. And so I think we've gone to a good place there, but the villain is to circle back, not fear. Fear is one of our heroes. And in fact, fear is a central figure in season one of our uh, story Bible. So how do you feel about female figures now? Well, do I think they're still hypersexualized? Is that what you were about to ask me? About, yeah. Yeah, of course. They're, you know, they, that is still happening in the market because they sell. Um, you know, we talk about Wonder Woman as this kind of I, feminist icon, but the reality is, is that until recently, 90% of the Wonder Woman audience was male. That's not my number. That's just data. And so obviously you're making an action figure appeal to uh, your audience. And so that still happens. But one of the things that we always say is that, you know, we were, we were at the um, forefront of this cultural zeitgeist. We asked a question that no one had ever asked before, but, um, but we just happened to ask it at the right time. And so, you know, we were able to get a lot of attention for it but a lot has followed in those six years. And obviously, you know, Wonder Woman wasn't even in development when we launched uh, the Wonder Woman movie. But in the last six years, there's been a huge shift in the way in which, in which the companies that create story and figures for, you know, Marvel and DC, they've shifted a lot. And so there's both now. There's there's action figures and content created for girls and young boys and girls. And then there's the adult line. And so I a hundred percent believe that the needle has moved tremendously. You know, I just, we just watched Milan and, you know, that's another good example mm -hmm. of um, the needle moving in, in that direction. And the fact that there's an audience for that kind of, portrayal of women and means that they're buying a different kind of action figure. But, uh, you know, and another thing I'll say too is, you know, there was a huge difference even in the last six years in the audience at Comic-Cons. You know, Comic-Con used to be really a, a, a sea of uh, Y chromosomes and that's really no longer the case. And so, you know, the cynic in me would say that the audience is there and so you make for your audience. But the reality is, is that it's really gratifying to see the larger companies embracing both sides. Now, Julie, you're a superhero in your own right. Not only do you have this incredible action figure line that's promoting your message, but you're also or making childhood cancer aware. How did you get started into that? Yes. Yeah, so this is a really gratifying and probably one of the best things that has come out of um, this entire experience, but it was born out of a, a tragedy, quite frankly. So um, a few years ago, four years ago, I think, I was um, standing in the outfield of my son's little league game and I got a phone call from a woman who wanted to speak to me uh, about her granddaughter. And her granddaughter was uh, a huge I Am Elemental fan, but she was battling childhood cancer and she'd been fighting very hard, but the, the end was coming. And she wanted to know if there was any way that we could get the new series, our new series at the time was Wisdom, action figures in her granddaughter's hand before she died. And we didn't have the figures. They they didn't exist yet, but I had prototypes. So we packed up the prototypes and um, made some personalized posters and hats and everything that we could possibly do for Anna. And we sent them off to her so that she could uh, see um, for herself what we were doing with uh, the next series before she died. And after she was gone, I felt just such profound loss. And I wasn't even, uh, you know, I wasn't family. I 
didn't know Anna personally, but there, I felt compelled to do something to celebrate and honor her. You know, we talked earlier about the fact that my mother died when I was young. And even though she was an adult, she had parents and her, my grandparents always said that to lose a child, it, it messes with the order of things, right? That it's, it, it's just not the way that kind of you expect life to um, unfold. And so I felt very strongly that there, there had to be something that we could do. And so we got involved in this Childhood Cancer Awareness Month program. So every September is the awareness month. And so what we decided to do was we decided that we were going to create this buy one, donate one program. So for every courage figure that someone purchases from us in the month of September, we donate one to a child with cancer. You, Tom, were really gracious enough and generous enough to participate this year. So you got your courage figure and another child will receive a courage figure on your in your behalf. And what happened is, is that it, it's been such a wonderful experience. I call it a happy, sad thing because, you know, to be able to do this is so gratifying and fills all of us in the I am elemental universe with such joy, honestly, but it's obviously a very sad circumstance, both the birth of it. And, you know, we sent the first year we sent a hundred action figures to Memorial Sloan Kettering and they had given them all out in less than a week. And so that just shows you how many children flowed into their hospital in less than a week. And that's one program. So you can only imagine, you know, how many children are struggling and suffering um, with cancer. And so, you know, it's, it's also been a real lesson for me, Tommy, because my friend raises money for cancer research. And um, she's raised $2 million, plus more than that, in the last four years. And every penny of it goes to cancer research. And she is a true superhero. And, you know, when I look at what I'm doing, it feels so small by comparison. But, um, but I've learned that it's really not about the amount. It's about what you are giving to people and the courage figures really act as a talisman, not just a toy and a source of inspiration. And so putting them in the hands of children with cancer has a tremendously powerful effect on everyone involved. And I'm thrilled that we're still doing it four years later. And to all our listeners, if you want to participate, you can log on to imelemental.com and purchase a courage figure with free shipping. So for every purchase you make, child will receive the same exact courage figure, which is wonderful. I mean, truly an inspiration. I mean, the courage that they're exhibiting every day of their lives and, and to have that kind of message fortified, so to speak, through the action figure is, is a good thing. And to your point, or yes, to confirm uh, free shipping anywhere in the United States. And uh, we do a $10 flat fee internationally. So we'll ship anywhere in the world uh, for a $10 flat fee. But um, I also just want to take the opportunity to say that you are not alone. You are one of our superheroes, but we've had a really wonderful response from the collector community this year, both in participation and in helping to spread the word. And so this year has been I mean, it's been a terrific year for us in terms of the number of action figures we're going to be able to distribute this year. So I'm very excited and happy about it, especially during such a difficult time. You know, one of the things that you and I didn't talk about was how hard it has been uh, as a small company to navigate these pandemic waters, so to speak. I don't know if it's because I'm living here in New York City and so it's so present in my life, um, this, this horrible situation that we're experiencing, but it, it really was hard for me 
to market my business for six months. And so, you know, I, I just kept in my head, Tom, thinking, people are dying, buy my action figure. It didn't work. And so it's incredibly gratifying this particular month after five months of real hand wringing to be able to, to see such a nice response because we're able to, you know, to, to do something positive with it. Well, thank you so much, Julie, for being on the show. Um, before I let you go, though, you mentioned that Justice is your next line that's coming out. Do we have a release date yet? Any plans for that? No sadly so um yes justice is series three and i'm very excited because um you know every series has its own special um news and so a different look and you know obviously different powers and for me this is the this is the best part of having this company is designing and conceiving of them. Um, but because we're in the middle of content development for the animated series and um, season one of the show covers series one, we've been asked to slow down on our production. So we have to ask everyone's patience for, uh, you know, for, well, wisdom, our six inch wisdom figure has not gone into production yet because again, because of development and, uh, and justice is, um, not ready for prime time, but we'll get there. Like I said, seven series. Uh, so hopefully everyone will stick around and see what we do next. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Julie. Thank you so much for having me, Tom. I really appreciate it. Oh, anytime. And then, uh, please come back. You're always welcome when, uh, justice or even the, your TV show finally comes out. So we're looking look forward, forward to that. I would, I would love to continue the conversation, and obviously I would be very excited to have an excuse to come back. Awesome. All right. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you once again to Julie Kerwin of I Am Elemental, and if you want to help with childhood cancer awareness for the month of September, please log on to IamElemental.com and purchase yourself one of these fabulous Courage action figures. 6.5 inch, 30 points of articulation. Trust me, you will not be disappointed. Once again, I am Elemental. Free shipping throughout the U.S. and a flat fee of $10 everywhere else. I am Elemental, the Courage figure. Let's get to the news. Vote for the most powerful man in the universe. He-Man deserves his place in the National Toy Hall of Fame. So if you have the time, please log on to toyhalloffame.com and vote for He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. And with 39 days counting down to Series 2 premiere of The Mandalorian on Disney+, Plus, The Mandalorian secured some great bounties in the Emmy Awards this past two weeks. Two weeks ago, with the Creative Arts Emmy Awards, which usually takes place the week before the Emmys, The Mandalorian won four awards. And with this week's Emmys, The Mandalorian was nominated for 15 and won seven. And also, it's just been announced that Tamara Morrison, I hope I pronounced that right, I just butchered it, will be Boba. Will be playing Boba Fett in season two of The Mandalorian. So that's, that's exciting correct. for all of us. Whether or not... There's speculation about how he he's going to be Boba Fett. Will you know? Will he be the version of Daniel? Was it Daniel Logan who played him in the mm-hmm. grown up? Will you know that? There's been rumors floating. Uh, I actually, what I hope, I'm kind of hoping he goes rogue and tries to take the child from the Mandalorian, and they they fight it out. That's what I want to see. Well, I guess we'll wait and see. Stranger Things resumes filming September 28th, season four. Cannot wait for this to come out. This weekend, nine September 25th, new Ghostbusters Afterlife will be releasing new info. I guess the director, um, which uh, Ivan, uh, Ivan, not Stein. Ivan, yeah, Ivan, so uh, he's gonna have, um, his own panel at HasbroCon this weekend, oh, and cool. he's going to release some new info about Ghostbusters Afterlife. Uh, Supernatural is finished filming. The sets have been destroyed, and it is all wrapped up. That will be resuming, I believe, next month, and stars 
uh, Jensen Ackles and Jared Padalecki, both to comb as a souvenir one of the Impalas of the which they drive around. And as you know, like in a, in a movie or TV show, they have several thing copies of each, and they each got one of the cars, which is pretty sweet. Um, so congratulations to them for wrapping up 15 years of a, a pretty cool show. Now for some toy news. The Star Wars Black Series Heroes of Endor figure set is available exclusively on Hasbro Pulse. This premium set is inspired by the scene in Return of the Jedi and in, on Endor, and it includes four figures, Han Solo, Princess Leia, Luke Skywalker, and Papalu, plus a speeder bike and six accessories. This thing is amazing. If you're a fan of Return of the Jedi, like I am, this is the set for you. This is right there. You got the, they're trying to get into that. The, the bunker. The bunker. Thank you. They're trying to get into the bunker. You know, that's where Han or Leia gets shot. R2 I mean, gets shot. <laughs> R2 gets shot. This is a great, this is a great set. I mean, this is what the black series is all about. I'm really excited for this. They were actually, you know what this, um, I read that this beat out another one that they were going to do it was um return of the jedi it was the atst which is another chicken walker it was the nickname is a chicken walker and it was kind of weird but the chicken walker was going to be um kind of like a a a statue of sorts where he was standing on one leg lifting up the other one with a squashed ewok underneath it but just kidding that's not that wasn't happening (laughs) i just i was just thinking of like this ATS, he's scraping his foot on a tree, trying to get the Ewok off, like when he's taking dog dookie. But I'm sorry, I ruined this. Uh, New York City Comic Con 2020, although it has been canceled, it will be uh, virtual and exclusives are being revealed. One of which is pretty sweet is the Rocketeer Noir figure. It's going to be the Mini Mate, it's going to be black and white. From a diamond select figure. Here's the interesting thing. Not only is it black and white, they said it's a black, white, and silver paint deco. Um, it's going to be priced at $9.99 exclusively through Dime, DST, Diamond Select Toys, I believe it stands for. And it's only going to be 300 made. Uh, it's pretty cool. And I'm, I'm glad to see Disney still doing things with the Rocketeer. It's like every so often... Uh, so that's that's pretty cool for you, Rocketeer guys. So Michael Keaton has already announced he's going to be in the next Flashpoint movie as Batman. But if you can't wait that long, Lego has just released the Batman jet from the 89 movie. It'll be available on October 21st. i not 100% sure about the price point, but if it's anything like the Batmobile, it's going to be expensive. That's Actually, yes, this is going to have... Uh, 2,363 pieces. It's four inches high, 20 inches long, 22 inches wide. And supposedly, it's going to have a removable canopy, interior, posable, posable rear flaps. And there's some kind of Easter egg. Tom, you might understand this better than me. I'm, it says included on a screen with Joker gas balloons. So I'm thinking that's like in the cockpit, that little mm-hmm. screen. And then it's going to have um, a bad engine, some bad engine label on the engine itself. Hmm. But um, the price, you know what? It's funny that you mentioned this because I, I saw it too, and I did not see a price out of all the information I found. Yeah, they're probably hiding it from us. All I know is it looks fantastic hanging upside down on a wall. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to say three hundred. Oh, easily. Yeah, that's my guess. I I don't know if I'm right or not. Um, that's what I'm throwing out there. Yeah. Congratulations to Tatiana Masalani, who is the new MCU She-Hulk. She's of Orphan Black from the BBC fame, and I think that I think it's great casting. I I can I can totally see her as Jennifer Walters, but. I mean, I'm sure She Hulk's going to be, you know, CGI and hmm. motion capture and all that. I am curious to see if they are going to use her voice. There's 
been some rumors that they may get a, a different actress with a deeper voice to actually voice She-Hulk. So that's going to be interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Did you see the uh, WandaVision trailer? Oh, my God. It's amazing. That looked great. And you know what I think made that trailer? Because the trailer's great. The mm-hmm. song they chose by the Platters. Yes. That song, um, something Twilight, uh, slipped my mind at the moment right now, but that song made the trailer. I, I just I watched it this morning after work, and I was just like, this looks really good. And it, it was just that song that just like really hit it off for me. It's kind of like with the Nirvana uh, for Batman for you. That was like, like this looks really good. I think that's going to come out right after Mandalorian. If I'm correct. Is that correct? December 2020. Okay. So yeah, I can't there. wait. I loved it. That that scene where he where Vision wakes up the neighbor in her car. Oh she, yeah. She's dressed up, and and he asks her why, and she's like, "You're dead." Yeah. And that right like, there. Oh my god. He's got like that cheesy suit on, of like like you know like yeah. fabric and makeup paint. You know. Um, that does look very good. Uh, this could set the standard for Disney plus Marvel shows. I mean, if this is as good as it looks, um, everything else is as a, you know, it's something to, to follow, which is, which is, Hey, cool. Uh, and a, a year going on strong for Disney plus. Thank yeah. God. They, thank God they launched last year or else. Yeah, we might, we might be having a different Disney conversation. I'll tell you, thank God they got the second season filmed, Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's going to help them out with, you know, not many shows or, or many shows going back to filming just now. Having this done, I mean, it's going to bring fans in where you're waiting at least to 2021 for season three of, like, say, Cobra Kai or you know, half Stranger Things is only halfway done maybe and i'm sure these kids had a growth spurt they might look different so i don't you know i still can't wait for that show but uh possibly doing a sequel to tusk uh did you like it by the way uh i have mixed emotions about it like there are some parts i thought were good but some yeah. others i thought were just cool. like i i I'll, I'll be honest with you the first time i saw it when he wakes up and he can't feel his legs, he's yeah. still he's still out of it and stuff. It's great. Scene. And then yeah, and then the the old man tells him, Oh, you got um you got bit by a spider. Uh, yeah. And then he just looks down and his legs are missing. That kind of messed me up a little. Uh, yeah. I'll be honest. With you. That, that that brought me into the movie. That was one of the best scenes Kevin Smith ever shot. Just and especially of him sitting there in the wheelchair, like on that, like that porch, it was like such a Stephen King misery moment. Um, and the thing is like, I'm not a Justin Long fan, but he was really good in this movie that you hate him because he's kind of like a jerk. And then you feel bad for him. You're like, Oh, but when you first told me about this movie, I was kind of like, this sounds ridiculous. And eventually I wound up watching it and, and I felt it was one of, I, f- I feel it's really one of his best movies, probably next to clerks. It's, it's a strange movie. Don't get me wrong. Johnny Depp was great in it. Just along was great in it. The concept's a little weird, but just the whole thing of what happens to him and that scene at the end, when you see him, as the walrus and you know his ex-girlfriend and his best friend come to visit him and his mind is just broken and you know he's the walrus so what i've heard and i'm pretty sure this is true kevin smith came up with an idea for the sequel if it ever gets done is that it will take place six years later and justin long's character who's gonna actually wind up doing this to people now i don't know who maybe he's gonna get back at his ex so what happens is somehow his obviously his mind is broken to the point where he thinks he's a walrus after the the psychological terror he goes through 
I guess he gets his mind back and somehow emerges from this walrus state, like, like a cocoon, back into a human. And then he's going to go and start doing this to people. I think the original plan was he would have he would have done it to the old man who did it to him, kind of as a revenge. But, you know, it could also go as a revenge story against his ex-girlfriend and his best friend for for um what they did behind his back. But um I didn't think there'd ever be a sequel to that movie. And when I heard about that, I was like, that's actually kind of cool. And I know it sounds weird if you're turned into a walrus and somehow you grow your legs back. But I think if you're if you're investing in a movie where a guy's being turned into a walrus you can kind of invest the other way, you know, and see him come out of it. Um, and I think that's just really what movies are, is just investing in, if you can invest yourself into the plot to the point where you're hooked, which is that what that movie did to me. There was this great scene with Johnny Depp when he's the, uh, the French policeman. And it, he was just about to catch the, he actually catches the, the old man, the killer. Um, and, He's not sure if it's him or not at first, and the old man's inviting him in because he plans on doing it to Johnny Depp's uh, character, uh, Guy Lapointe. And there's just this great, like uh, I believe it's like improv too, this great back and forth, and like Johnny Depp is just so great in that role, and it's you know typical typical Johnny Depp. He's hidden under makeup. He's playing a strange character, but um, he he was great in it. Uh, so yeah. Possibly a Tusk 2. Um, tusked, maybe. I don't know. But yeah, possibly a Tusk 2, which I think is kind of cool. Speaking of sequels, there might be a Napoleon Dynamite 2. There's been talk that John Hedder, I believe that's his last name. Yeah, it sounds Hedder. familiar. Yeah, he, he said uh, he's been in talks with the original directors for a sequel to Napoleon Dynamite. What has he been doing lately? I think Probably talking about Napoleon Dynamite too. Yeah, he was kind of popular afterwards. You know, he did that movie with Will Ferrell, the ice skating. He did like one or two movies. He did some voice work. You know, well, yeah, there there was a Napoleon Dynamite cartoon. Uh, MTV was on it? Fox Five. Yeah, oh, Fox it, Five. Okay. It was. It was. It didn't last long. Maybe five episodes. Uh, well, uh, making a cartoon out of a movie or making a series out of a movie is so risky. Oh. Yeah. If, you're, if anybody's ever seen the clerk's pilot um, that, I don't know, I think it was Channel 7 made, Kevin Smith had no involvement. Uh, it had a... Well, yeah. originally, Kevin Smith did have involvement. Oh, did he? Until the executive producer came... They had a meeting. The executive producer... This is how I understood it. The executive producer said... Well, I'm getting creator credit for the TV show. That's ridiculous. And Kevin Smith's like, "Really? You're you're you created Clerks?" Yeah. He's like, "Well, yeah, the TV show version." So Kevin Smith, you know, he sat through the whole meeting, excused himself, went outside, lit a cigarette, looked at his friend, and he's like, "I'm getting the hell out of here. No way is this happening," and took off. And it is a terrible pilot. Um, Felicity, isn't it? The girl who played Felicity. Yeah, Goat Boy. Goat Boy, Jim Brewer. Yeah, Jim he, Brewer. he played Randall. And yeah, he. Nobody was cast well. the The quick stop was in like a a mall area. Um, and they added a character like um yeah uh, like a sidekick kid, almost like yeah. um. It's just so terrible. Like if you're kevin smith fan and a clerks fan it's you well, it's, i know what give it a watch because yeah i was gonna say that. things it's like the star wars christmas special i was about to say that too yes this is the holiday special of the kevin smith verse um you know and it's not his fault it's i do think if he made it it would have been good you know you would have had jay and bob you would have had a just you know it's just a plot maybe because there's really no plot to this one and yeah it's it's brutal but it's interesting if you're a fan i would say check it out like you say 
Yeah, the Clerks cartoons are way better though. Oh yeah, Leonardo, Leonardo. Yeah. Um. Oh my God, Bears driving car. How could that be? That's right. right. <laughs> Henry Cavill has just signed a three picture deal for a Superman franchise. Now that's interesting because I heard Brandon Ruth might be in the Flash. Yeah. So are they going for like the, a multiverse effect here? Of course they are. That's 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 the big thing now. Ever since Spider Verse. Oh boy. I don't like these. Is it? Would you call? Would you say there's a turtle verse out there somewhere? Oh yeah. And, um. What was it? Turtle oh, forever or something like that. Yeah. Right. I guess yeah, that's, that, yeah. that's that was years before. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Like, I would like. I said I would love to see a, a mirage hardcore. I mean, black and white turtle. Oh, cartoon. yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, Put that on like a cable channel. Oh my god, that'd be awesome. Oh yeah. I don't know who you'd get to voice him, but because you gotta get like it's a it's a the original the comic was so gritty that you would have to get the right voices for the characters. Mm. You know, that would be cool though. That's that's a good point. Mm. McFarlane toys, Todd McFarlane's been busy, just released some pictures of Batman figures based on the last night on Earth. You see Batman in a straight jacket holding a lantern with the Joker's head in it. Oh. But here is the best figure he's coming out with this series. There's going to be a Build-A-Figure, and it's Bane. Oh. This thing is massive. I saw uh, preliminary pictures of it. Huge. And the Scarecrow is going to be on his back. Writing Bane, the whole you know that's strange. It, it's amazing this figure. I mean, I know a lot of people are saying McFarland's making too many Batman figures, but I mean, let's face it, DC pretty much has given up on their whole universe other than Batman. So yeah, Batman selling. But the movie coming out, um, Robert Patterson's um, better now. To yeah, he's back to work. Yeah, they're resuming filming. Um, they're going to want to hype Batman as much as they can. Uh, so, yeah, I was actually trying to find a Batman, uh, you know, face mask for, you know, the cover of your nose and mouth. Um, with the batch symbol. I couldn't find one. Um, I'm sure it's out there somewhere. It's master. Yep. All these figures are based on the art of Greg Capullo. And then McFarlane also showed some DC death metal figures. Wonder Woman looks pretty cool. She's got like a mohawk going. So Capullo, he did um, Court of Owls, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's a great book. And then the Batman motorcycle. It's just bat bones, really. Just bat bones in a wheel. He's bat to the bone. <laughs> exactly. Super <laughs> 7, you can pre, if you're a Thundercats fan, the pre-order for Linkso, Monkey Man, Pumra, and Snowman of Hook Mountain. Also referred to for you Thundercats aficionados as Snow Knight. They're all up on the Super 7 website for pre-order. So hopefully we don't have to wait forever to get them. So this coming out of Germany, Mattel has... Well, I don't know if it's a Mattel photo, but the Germans have released a picture of Origins Castle Grayskull. Oh, yes. I saw a picture. Yeah, I saw this. Included with the castle is Temple of Darkness Sorceress, and they're saying it'll be fifty to seventy-five dollars as the price point. And also, I guess you don't have to wait till twenty twenty-one in January to go to your local store or shop online for Origins figures, as apparently they're going to be released in November, right before Christmas, everywhere. I'm not thinking just because of turtle figures out there. Yeah, that'd yeah, be a happy NECA. guy. Yeah, NECA needs to step up on that. And speaking of He-Man, if you're still interested, there are plenty. Well, they're up to 40% sold. The Pixel Dan Masters of the Universe Compendium set still available at powercon.com. Power hyphen con.com. Don Bluth Studios is now open. 
You may recognize the famous animator from such shows as Base Ace, Dragon's Lair. Oh, arcades as well. Secret of Nim, right. which is my personal favorite. Yeah, He just right. opened up a, a new studio, Don Bluth Studios, that will focus on hand-drawn animation. So thank God it's about time. That's You know what? That's cool that he's going 2D. And he got his start at Disney. And he was one of the guys who striked. And a lot of his films have the look of a Disney film. That's where he, he learned. But Dragon's Lair as an arcade game, a cartoon arcade game is like in the, even to this day is groundbreaking to me. Um, so that's awesome. He opened up a studio. Does, did he announce any films yet? Not yet. He, uh, he just hooked up with a vice president for his company, but nothing's been announced. Good for him. I know. I really think Disney should be still doing this. Like, do a, do a CGI one, do a traditional one. Do a CGI, do a tra- – don't forget your roots. It's, it's what made the company move forward, but don't forget. Uh, at least that's my two, my two cents on it. Two last things. So Borat has a sequel. It's already filmed, and it's currently looking for distribution. When did they film that? Probably last year sometime. Although, who knows? Cause, was, I mean, yeah. most of it is just, you know, just live action. Or not live action, but, you know, based in reality. I mean, that was pretty quiet. Yeah? I I, I didn't hear any of, about them making this movie until until now. Not that I, I follow the actor much, but, um, you know, I, I didn't know he was still doing these characters. And I'm gonna go into detail next episode with this but i am furious at this news the venture brothers got canceled after seven seasons 17 years however there is hope that they may continue on hbo max now i'll get into more detail next episode but very upsetting venture brothers is a fantastic show the fact that Adult Swim even consider canceling it is ridiculous. But at the same time, what they've been doing with the DC Universe, moving everything over to HBO Max, I'm not surprised. So I'm actually kind of scared. This might be the death knell for Adult Swim. So, wait a second. If Adult Swim is gone, that means no more Primal? Uh, I, well, you can find Primal right now on HBO Max. Yeah, but they might not finish it. I don't well. I I, I need to know. I don't know because they finished Adventure Time, and then HBO Max has a BMO uh, show Uh, on HBO HBO Max. So I'm thinking they may just lose the actual station and just move everything over to streaming. Uh, This is a fantastic show. This is one of those shows that, in my opinion, solidified Adult Swim. You can argue your Harvey Birdman, yeah, absolutely, your Sea Lab, Space Ghost, but Venture Brothers was one of those breakout shows on Adult Swim. I mean, every Sunday when they first started that first season, every Sunday I was glued to my TV, couldn't wait for it. Every place I went to, if I was hanging out with a friend, they are like, we, we got to watch Venture Brothers, we got to watch Venture Brothers. And the second we saw it, Everybody got hooked. My wife, Mary, not a big cartoon person. I got her to watch Venture Brothers. She watches it every week. Well, when it was on. So that about wraps it up for this week's Toy Lines. Once again, thank you to Julie Kerwin of I Am Elemental for joining us. Thank you to Brian Salvatore for our intro-outro music. Thank you to Shared Universe Podcast Studio. Email us at toyspodcast.com at gmail.com if you want to be a part of the conversation. Listen to us on all your favorite podcast platforms, Podbeam, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, even iHeartRadio, which we're actually starting to pick up listeners. Nice. Please subscribe, give us a rating, or please do both. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Toylines. 
on social media. You can even find us on Facebook at Toy Lines or Toy Shelf Magazine. And for the latest news and toy reviews, you can log into www.toy-lines.com and find the latest action figure toy reviews. I'm Tom Romero. I'm Ian Westhoff. Play with your toys. See you next week. Take care.